Should I take it away then, or do we still wait for some more people to, to join? I would say uh, we wait. A, okay, we'll wait a couple of minutes. seconds, maybe, and then we can slowly start. There's Just give me the go, and then I'm, I'm ready. Okay, hey, I think we have reached critical mass. So, on behalf of the British Chamber of Commerce in Germany and of uh, Geopolitical Intelligence Services, I am very glad to welcome you to our webinar, Supply Chain and Global Free Trade in the Post-Coronavirus World. Um, we have a very, very good group of speakers today um, that I will introduce uh, just before they, singly just before they, um, start speaking, but I'll just give the names right now. We have Prince Michael of Liechtenstein. Uh, we have Professor Enrico Colombato. We have Professor Enrique Schneider and Enrique, sorry, I mispronounced this. And we have um, uh, Jürgen Müller from, from, from Daimler. Um, just before we launch into the topic, let, allow me um, um, to do some housekeeping rules so we all know how, what the rules of the discussion are. My name is Mark Fischer. I'm a partner at G plus Europe, um, uh, um, a political agency in Berlin. Um, so, rules of discussion. Um, all the participants are um, actively encouraged to ask questions to the panel. You can do this via the chat function. I will see those questions and then I will take them up and direct them to the panel. If you have questions for a particular speaker, please um, 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 underline this in, uh, when, when you write the question in, in, the, in the chat. Um, the sequence is going to be, we're going to have short um, um, impulse statements from our four speakers. Then I I'm going to engender a discussion between the speakers on the panel, so to say, figuratively speaking. And then as quickly as possible, I want to turn to the audience and see um, uh, what kind of questions we get. So without much further ado, let's launch into supply chain and global free trade in the post-coronavirus world. Um, we want to look at this issue um, that is probably on very, very many minds um, um, today. That's why we also got a pretty good turnout on, on the um, participants. Um, we want to look at this while analyzing the present situation very much with a, with a perspective of forward looking, not just sticking, sticking to the moment right now, but what's the future going to look like? What's the next year going to look like in the medium term afterwards? And we're going to look at this from a geopolitical and from an economic perspective, because obviously the consequences of this crisis are going to be in, in, in both fields or, or in, in all the fields that, that cover um, economic and uh, areas and policy. So let me first turn um, to Prince uh, Michael of Liechtenstein. Um, let me say a few words of her, uh, towards him. Um, he studied uh, social, uh, social and economic studies in Vienna. Uh, after that, he, he was in senior positions for Nestlé from 1978 to 1987. Then he returned to um, Liechtenstein and became um, managing director with Industrie und Finanzkontor Etz, which is a leading trust company in Liechtenstein and internationally. Uh, and then, on his own initiative, he is now the chairman of, of uh, uh, Industrie und Finanzkontor Etz, as well as 
the founder and chairman of geopolitical intelligence services, one of the organizers of, of this event. Um, Prince Liechtenstein is also Prince Michael von Liechtenstein is also a member of various professional organizations, uh, including uh, the European Center of, uh, for Austrian Economics, the Foundation of Vaduz, and interestingly enough, also the co-founder of the International Institute of Longevity. Prince Michael, please give us an introduction into the topic today. Um, we're looking forward to your comments. Um, thank you, and thank you for for for, for having uh, me me here. The topic is, is pretty wide, but I believe one, um, if one has a disruption, a big disruption, which actually this crisis and the lockdown of the crisis brought, it depends on, on what it hits. It's like the virus itself. If the coronavirus hits somebody who is very healthy, the damage is normally uh, pretty small. Now, this lockdown hit uh, an, a world economy which was as healthy as, as, as it should have been because it was laid down and a lot of it was built on that. So this makes uh, made the economy pretty fragile. There's also a political as aspect on it that we had a period of certain globalization we hoped that we would reduce uh, protectionism, which we didn't totally um, um, re um, succeed, but it, there was a, a lot of free trade. And this uh, free trade and this trade and um, allowed also a lot of people to get out of poverty and out of hunger, etc. And there was a real increase in global uh, prosperity. But unfortunately, also some of them was that uh, driven. Now, we are in, in a new situation where we had basically a lockdown of the economy for, 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 quite, for quite a while. It hit very much primarily the productive sector with the supply chains, which we will which we, 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 we talk about it. But then on the other side, there is a loss of income on the, uh, for instance, out of the uh, service industries. And the service industries have become the most important sector in the whole, in the, in the, in the whole de 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 developed world, which will then also be a problem for the manufacturing industry on the, de on the, uh, on the demand side. So that it, it, um, it, it's being uh, crushed from uh, two sides. There is another aspect, which we, which we will all also see, there is, on the political way, an increasing fragmentation of the world. It seems that there is there's this conflict between the, 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 the US and, and China, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit um, longer. It's not just what we call the conflict of uh, was blamed on President Trump between China and, and the US. It was also an issue is, uh, does China follow um, global rules or doesn't it follow so and I think now China tries to become more protectionist as it, as it was already it wants also to open its own block wants to get out of the dollar system getting independent of that which will make it more difficult to trade with, uh, with China there is an, another very important point just to, to, to put up a, a few uh, questions. It's the uh, tourism industry. The tourism industry is one of the most important um, uh, sectors in quite a few countries. And this industry is uh, pretty dead. And I know also a few, uh, quite a number of European areas uh, would start to get in troubles without Chinese tourists coming. The moment they stay away, and the question is, will they? come back. This is, a, this is a, a general matter. The other matter is that a, a lot of um, the central banks and governments want to provide a lot of uh, money for the economy. But is it really arriving there? And, and if it arrives there, will we get inflation? Because we have now a situation, which I think is also a paradox, often, that we have on one side, if we look less purchase power of, of a part of the population, 
the, let's say the supply chains working again in the manufacturing. They are working. We will have a, a, an overcapacity, which is deflationary. On the other side, we have a large supply of money, which might be, depending on the, on the speed of circulation, become inflationary. So we, we are entering quite a, a number of problems. The other thing is with the increasing protection has been coming back to, uh, to the uh, supply chains. Um, it, will, it increased the productivity very high by the system of just-in-time delivery. Uh, I think it, uh, the crisis shows that one, uh, one uh, might have to have more strategic reserves. And for instance, China is already insisting on that and will in their, let's say, very direct, if not to say brutal way, they will insist that all manufacturers have strategic reserve of, um, of, of supplies, which is again a, a capital problem. So we, we have a whole conundrum of issues which, which we have to, uh, to see and, and, and to look at, and which will be a big challenge for the manufacturing industries. And I didn't now concentrate my thing on the supply chains because Professor Colombato and Professor Schneider and Mr. Muller will, will come to that. But I wanted to put that together, this whole conundrum, as an introductory statement. Thank you very much, Prince Michael. I think that was an excellent overview, so to say, the, 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 the 10,000 foot view of the different aspects of the, of the problems that come through this um, an overused word, but I will use it, unprecedented shock that we've seen through the coronavirus uh, from inflationary pressures hitting an already uh, uh, fragile system that, is, that was politically and uh, uh, economically fragmented already, um, uh, WTO not having been able to basically continue with its function for the last 10, 10 15 years now. Um, I think you've, you've got, given us and, and the panel a lot of um, food for thought, so um, without further um, second guessing, let me turn to um, Professor Enrico Colombato. Professor Col Colombato is a professor of economics at the University of Torino in, in Italy. He's also the director of research at the Institute, no, Institut de Recherche Économique et Fiscale, IREF, in Paris. Um, he, is, he has numerous international appointments uh, on uh, scientific bodies. Uh, um, I hope you will forgive me, Professor Colombato, if I don't go into the details of those, because they are too many. They are very, very impressive in, in their international nature. You must have seen a lot of the world. Um, and he holds the degrees of, in, in Economic and uh, Commercio in the Uni University of Torino, and uh, from the London School of Economics, also a, a Master in Economics, and a PhD in Economics, also from the London School of Economics. Uh, Professor Colombato. Um, you are, you are joining us from, from Italy, as I understand. Um, uh, also, of course, a country who's, who has been, that has been hit extremely hard um, 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 by the virus, also economically, um, that was already in a fragile state. We are looking very much forward to, to hearing you. Thank you. Yes, I would say that we've been hit particularly hard because of the way we managed, or perhaps mismanaged the whole story. Just to set the record straight, the number of victims we've had um, provoked a number of deaths, which is less than 5% greater than the normal, the standard uh, value we saw during the past year. So I don't want to minimize the problem. But what I also want to say is that the reactions by the authorities I'm not talking about all dramas, but if anybody they really made things worse. So just very quickly, I'm going to make four points, which I'm not going to develop in full, but just as a foot for thought. Uh, this COVID-19 story has drawn attention to four different issues. Uh, issue number one, supply chains have to be revised and restructured. Uh, the problem in supply chains, so technically, the way suppliers and the quantity of goods suppliers were provided to the buyers has been uh, 
too much centralized. That is, the problem is not who having is not in having uh, too many suppliers spread out in the world. The problem is that we have concentrated our suppliers in a limited number of countries and without diversifying and multiplying the number of suppliers for each stage of production. So uh, point number one, rather than centralizing, which is what people usually argue for in these days, we should promote even more intense decentralization. If you're facing new risks, you want to diversify your risk. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So we'll have to think supply chains again. We'll have to reconsider them, but rather than reducing the number of supply, suppliers and reducing the number of countries from which our supplies come, we should expand both the number of suppliers and the number of countries from which these supplies come. So we're actually going to need more globalized views of our supply chains. Now, this was topic number one. Topic number two, producers have been used to looking ahead by considering uh, product cycles, that is the fact that uh, some producer might fall behind in innovation or in uh, following uh, consumers' preferences. So this is product cycles. We have been used to thinking about um, cyclical swings, that is growth rate, macro growth rate going up and down. Now we have to think about major shocks. Now, once again, this is not quite a major shock. We knew about COVID-19 since last November. It appears that uh, all sorts of governments had been informed about it. What they did is virtually nothing, and then the shock came. Uh, be that as it may, companies will have to think about shocks, not only about cyclical swings. That will, once again, uh, regard the supply chains. It will have to do with inventories, because having low inventories may be bad when you are in an expansionary uh, moment. That when demand drops, uh, for a variety of reasons, look at what happened during the past two months, having large inventories may be extremely expensive. So once again, the solution comes from revising supply chains, keep your inventories low, and react to surges in demand by raising prices or by asking suppliers to increase their supplies. But the inventory strategy has to be, so to speak, revised. Point number three, one of the main problems we've had during the past few months was liquidity shortages, which also means that during the past 10 years, think about well, 12 years, think of the 2008 crisis, which was again a liquidity crisis, we've learned very little. Uh, put differently, um, the, the only thing the financial system has been able to do is to ask and beg for help from central bankers. Now, central bankers should not flood markets with the liquidity. Their purpose and their job does not consist in bailing out badly, poorly managed banks or handing out cheap money to poorly managed companies who maybe rely too much on borrowing and too little on risk capital equity. So message number three, financial structures have to be thought about and revised. Banks should stop financing governments and they should rather finance companies. Go back to what banking used to be. Point number four in just 20 more seconds, uh, we have to be very careful about the danger that these crises, these shocks, uh, may turn into major boosts for regulatory purposes. 
the name of the game today is we need more regulation in order to offset the negative effects of shocks. We need the opposite. Regulation has actually made a shock uh, much sharper and much more painful than it could have been. This is the time to deregulate rather than to regulate. And regulators have actually proven as having done a fairly poor job during the past 15 years, at least. I'm done. Unmuting, sorry. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, one quick question um, 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 to your first uh, uh, point, and thank you for this very, um, um, very structured and, and, and very disciplined presentation. Um, uh, you mentioned the problem with concentration of suppliers. Uh, um, and that we've made ourselves vulnerable through that. My question is only due to the, uh, I would say, intensified competition between potential suppliers by the very fact of globalization, the direct competition between different countries and different systems, isn't that systemic, so to say, that you will have a concentration of suppliers because the others just can't compete and then will go under? And haven't we seen that in, 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 in many uh, uh, suppliers for specific goods that you, you used to have five, six, seven, ten companies to do this stuff, and now maybe you have two left, and if you're particularly unlucky, you have one global supplier left who really dominates the market. Yes, well, the point is, of course, we were looking for large suppliers because large suppliers um, enhance economies of scale. Now we have to change tack. That is, we have to be able um, to suffer from having a larger number of smaller suppliers mm -hmm. and forget about China and only China. I mean, China is fine as a supplier, but it would be extremely dangerous if China was your only supplier. We have to look around and uh, make sure that competition gives us back what we might lose in economies of scale. And once again, it depends on government that is, the more governments will allow companies to flourish and develop their entrepreneurial skills, the more efficient our suppliers will be. So we have a chance for new suppliers. So new suppliers wake up and uh, introduce yourself. We'll be happy to take you on. Thank you very much for clarification. Um, I'm going to turn now to um, Professor Henrik Schneider. Um, Professor Schneider is actually uh, uh, chief economist, wait, okay, uh, chief economist of the Swiss Federation of um, SME, small and medium-sized enter enterprises. He's also a board member of the Swiss uh, Pension Fund. Obviously, an economist uh, um, um, by training, uh, teaches uh, at, at university level, and I think your your presentation is going to segue uh, um, quite nicely with what uh, uh, Professor Colombato um, um, just introduced to us. Please, Professor. In a matter of fact, I'm just giving the explanation why Professor Colombato in, is right in everything he said. <laughs> but let me begin with something that we economists consider fun. Well, we have a very eccentric definition of fun, but for us, quoting random numbers has always been a source of joy and pleasure. Um, Imagine 1981, so barely 40 years ago. On this planet, there were more than 40% of its population living in extreme poverty. More than 40% living on less than 1.9 US dollars a day. By 2015, by 2015, we could reduce this number to 10%. Of course, it's still a lot of people living in extreme poverty, but the reduction of poverty was not the fruit of some social planning, of some engineering, let alone of development aid. It was a fruit of incorporating a lot of countries, a lot of countries, Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, into the global chains of creation of value. So when Professor Colombato says we need suppliers everywhere, then be assured this is good for the suppliers too. By their incorporation into our value chain, they 
can turn out to be better off. I'm still on the fun side of life, so let's go uh, with more numbers. Think about the, the, the global trade, EU and US. 13% of all imports of the US come from the European Union. And 21% of all imports of the European Union come from the US. The same, on a similar scale, is also true in the US-China relation. 11% of export to China, sorry, in the European-China relation, 11% of all exports to China, of all exports of the EU go to China, and 20% of the imports of the EU go to China. So here too, we are part of this massive chain of global value add. And the diversification that Enrico Colombato was referring before is something that we have today, but it's also something that is at risk. Because if this corona crisis, or however you want to mention or name it, showed us something is that it accelerated protectionism. Protectionism is nothing new. In the last 10 years, we have been witnessing a new surge in protectionism. Since the financial crisis 2007 to 9, the protectionistic measures have been rising everywhere. And probably after the corona crisis, they are going to accelerate again. Of course, protectionism comes in different flavors. We have the EU flavor, which is to regulate everything. Either you, com either you comply with the EU regulation or you cannot play. And then we have the more brutish way of the United States, which is to, protect, to do protectionism via tariffs. China has a different form of protectionism, which is a protectionism masked in trade is in fact a, a masquerading of isolationism in trade, for example, via the Belt and Road strategy. Either you play by Chinese rules, either you accept Chinese technology as the lead way, either you adapt to the Chinese way of making business, and either you accept that the Chinese companies will always profit most, or you simply do not belong into the block. Don't forget one thing. Whenever we are talking about protectionism, it's not only or merely about an economic project. Usually, it's also a geopolitical project. Of course, the US wants to establish itself as the sole hegemony standing. China has a hegemonic project of its own. And even the European Union have a little bit of a different one, but there's also a hegemonic project. Some enterprises, some companies live under the impression that it is a good idea to be part of a hegemonic project. From the individual perspective, it may pay off. Imagine all these armament dealers in the Cold War. They were doing fine. But from a general perspective, and especially if you take the socioeconomic perspective of the individual citizens, it was much better when the Cold War came to an end, the Berlin Wall came down, and we were able to incorporate all these economies that were separated and segregated in their different blocks. So when Professor Colombato asks us to diversify on the managerial and company level, then the normative pendant to it would be to diversify globally by integrating even more, by globalizing even more. Unfortunately, the problem is that the tendency seems to go in the other way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, as, I, as I had hoped, those, those two um, presentations actually complemented each other quite well from, from, from different, different levels, um, um, so to say. Um, let me turn um, 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 to another chief economist, 
Um, um, unfortunately, um, our original speaker, Eka von Klein, had to bow out on, uh, in the last minute. But um, Daimler obviously is very well organized, and so they, they, they came up with a more than adequate um, uh, replacement, which is um, uh, Jürgen W. Miller, chief economist at Daimler, um, obviously an economist by training, studied at the University of Freiburg, um, has been um, uh, with, uh, with Daimler for a long time, since 1987, if I got that right. Um, um, so a real in-house expert. And of course, uh, he's also the head of the um, econ economy and market intelligence section, um, which basically uh, deals with um, all, all the uh, um, um, broad spectrum questions um, uh, within these fields. Um, obviously, you come with a specific perspective from a, um, a, um, one of the, the biggest uh, international German slash international automakers. Um, 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 you told us beforehand you were going to base your, your comments on, on, on the original comments from Eckhard von Kleden. But of course, um, uh, we're delighted to have you here. Please give us your perspective. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for having me and accepting me as a substitute for, for Eckhard von Kleden. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, although I'm an economist, I just rather start with sharing some of the geopolitical aspects. Uh, this is um, what Eckhard von Klein would have done if, if, he were, if he were here. And no surprise, some of the things I would like to mention have already been, been said by, by the, by the um, dear colleagues before. Um, we, we make every, every year we make an exercise, so to speak, at Daimler, and at the beginning of the year we look at long-term trends and we just look whether there are new trends or um, other trends uh, popping up, be it economic trends or, or political trends. And if we compare what we have said at the beginning of this year, what we see right now, it's obvious that we don't see too many uh, new trends. It's rather that existing trends have been accelerated by COVID-19. And, and one of these, some of these accelerated, accelerated trends I would like to, to, to share with you. One is, I think this was partly mentioned, one is populism, uh, which is a critically, critical issue and this is not new, but I think this could receive a further boost um, if the elites and institutions are not able to handle the crisis uh, successfully. Uh, this depends on many, many known unknowns as we, as we call them, and, and especially on the duration of the crisis. The longer the crisis lasts, the harder it will be to, 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 to cope with this problem. And especially in Germany right now, you can see already that we have a huge debate on, um, on the restrictive government measures being taken, whether they're right or not, whether they should be more open or so. And this, this debate on coherence and usefulness of measures is, is critical as, as long as they, they last. And uh, we will, that is one of the trends, this is populism, which existed before. Another thing is, and this was mentioned by the colleagues as well, is, is multilateralism versus firstism, as we may call it. Um, basically, this, this trend changed from a rule-based to a power-based power uh, international order. And that's not only the U.S., which is um, focusing on that issue, um, but, but we guess, especially the U.S., in, after COVID-19, is even more focusing on domestic policy issues and rather withdraws even more from the international, international stage, which is really a problematic, because if they are followers, this lead then finally to erosion of multilateral institutions, which is not good news for the global, for the global trade system. Another, the third point I want to mention, which is very, very important from, uh, for us from a business perspective, is the, the buzzword of decoupling, decoupling of technology and markets. Uh, this trend is also not new, uh, and, but this is, uh, as, and unfortunately, we see right now uh, a rather um, intensifying trend of this decoupling, specifically between China and, and the US, uh, due to this, also this uh, ongoing blame game, uh, who is responsible for COVID-19 who has something wrong in, in this respect. And this, 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 uh, this point of decoupling is from the business perspective, leading to various standards and a separation of, of technology needed in the various areas in the world we need to cover. This is very costly, very inefficient, and this puts us in a very uncom uncomfortable position. And I think we have already discussed how Europe copes in this area between the US and China, and both setting uh, various and different um, and standards. And finally, the, the fourth point, the fourth trend, uh, this was just mentioned by, by the two colleagues as well, is protectionism, and you may call it globalization. You mean this protectionism was already there before COVID-19, and I fully agree to what Mr. Schneider said, that there, 
it, it, it will rather intensify. And he mentioned the different flavors of, of uh, protectionism. No matter what flavor it is, we don't like these flavors, uh, not, not being a global company. And, uh, but uh, you, we, we do see, not only in the US, in very various countries, industrial policies, which just try to treasure and to relocate and nationalize global supply chains. And from a business point of view, this is not the most efficient way because we rather try to have it central, centralized as, as possible. Um, and, and also, uh, regarding protectionism, we, can, we might tackle in the discussion also on the point of um, whether or not uh, there might be calls for stricter foreign direct investment screenings. This, 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 this threat, the threat of who is buying what, especially the huge um, state wealth funds which exist globally, and if you look at the market capitalization of many, many companies in these crises, they are rather low. And uh, so that, that's, these are the four key points. And just allow me a fun, 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 fun final remark, just as in terms of the supply chain, we shouldn't expect after COVID-19 a dramatic change of, of global supply chains. Business, we from business perspective, we, we have tried to, to get the most efficient way how to handle our business. And we will, we will, we'll have to adjust the global supply chain. So that, that's for sure. But we won't change them dramatically. It's more about making the system, the supply chain, more resilient to external shocks rather than to, rather than to fully change it. And the second aspect is, and this goes in, in the direction which also already mentioned, is um, going more in the direction for producing local for local. This is the best hedge you have against any of these measures, be it protectionism or whatever. I just think I just keep it here. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, let me just, um, and, and I think all the presentations that we heard fit quite well into, in, into each other, like little Lego blocks, um, um, because I think there is a, a, a fairly large amount of agreement on, on the nature of the problems that we're facing. Uh, uh, um, number one is, if I, if I may paraphrase, um, we, even before COVID, obviously already for a while, we had faced, so to say, a backlash, a, a political and economic backlash against um, globalization um, um, with different techniques. Um, you mentioned um, um, China, USA, the EU it, itself using different protectionist measures. And if I may paraphrase, COVID, so to say, could act as a catalyst to actually um, accelerate um, 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 this shock and, 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 and um, these trends against globalization. And we need to live in, uh, um, with the consequences of this and come up with strategies um, um, to address this. Before I go further into the topic, though, let me remind some of the first questions that are trickling in from the audience. You can ask questions by common function, function all the time. Uh, they pop up here on my screen, and I'll be happy um, um, to post specific questions um, to specific uh, panel members or even to the panel as a whole. Um, so please don't be shy. Um, comment, uh, uh, ask questions, challenge our, our, our panelists. That's what we're here for. Um, one word, um, uh, Mr. Muller, that you mentioned, I think um, 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 that, um, uh, that I'd been waiting for to come up is resilience. I think a, sh a shock like this um, um, uh, uh, that, that comes that you know, no, nobody was really prepared for just underlines the importance to build resilient um, um, systems. And, and that's why I see the general trend in all of your presentations and also in all the discussions that I've been following online. Um, the idea of resilience has been around for a while, obviously, people understand it, but uh, the need to really prepare, of course, before the crisis um, arrives, very often gets overshadowed by dealing with the, with, with the day to day work and, and, and also, of course, trying to to maximize um, um, in, in the business world, trying to maximize profits, um, just in time was, was mentioned a, a number of times, uh, trying to make your, your systems as efficient as possible, but if you make them as efficient, as efficient as possible, that squeezes out resilience. So what I see as a, as a general trend in, in the presentations that you gave is there probably will have to be a rebalancing between uh, profit maximization, um, uber efficiency, if I may, may call it like that, and resilience, and also with that, if you break it down, um, um, re, rebalancing, and also um, um, maybe renationalizing or putting, putting to specific regions 
specific production, even if they can be can can be produced um, more cheaply and more and, and more efficiently in other areas. Prince Michael, would you like to comment on 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 this general trend, if I if I may ask you? You're muted. I think a, a bigger resilience is, is necessary. I think that there, there, there are uh, two points there. One, which Professor Colombato said, you probably have to diversify your supply chains because you, you can't uh, preview all your risk. You can only mitigate it by a certain diversification. The second thing is, is how do you uh, re, uh, rely, let's say, on the reliability of, the, of, of your s s supply chain. That means you, know, you, you will need certain strategic reserves. And it was very efficient to, uh, to be in, in the just-in-time system. And I was also, when I was involved in business, I wasn't better than other ones. We were just looking at just-in-time and not having too much stocks, too much reserves. But I think we, we will need a come, so we will need to come to a situation where we are more resistant to, um, uh, to, to interruptions. And we see that the, as well the, um, uh, the economic as the political environment is getting rougher. There, 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 there are lots of indications. And so we have to, we have to, to be prepared. And if I look back to, to company levels, we have to be uh, very healthy. We have to see that our that, that we have the right products to the market, we have the, uh, the, the right supply chains that we can, uh, can continue to do it. And also we have, to, uh, we have to have the right financing. And I think we will have in future to see a lot more that we can do our investments also with equity, building up higher equity to be also more resilient to difficult times and then not having to run to the government, et cetera, for, for support. Thank you, Prince Michael. I actually have here a, a question from the audience. Um, European companies have already started to diversify their supply chains, different suppliers, but also reorientation towards Europe. Question is, is Europe capable to deliver all the needed supply out of Europe, or are we facing another problem by doing so? Um, I would uh, pitch this one to uh, both professors, Professor Colombato and Professor uh, um, Schneider. So we'll go in alphabetical order, if that makes it easier. Oh, no, yeah, you go first, Professor Colombo. Uh, you know, each company has got its own features and it's gone by and its own needs. So you don't have a one hat for all uh, sizes, even in this case. What I'm saying is, however, that you may want to think of diversifying into Europe. However, uh, one thing is to say, I want to diversify, say, if you're a German producer, and I want to have suppliers from Spain, from Sweden, from Britain, or from you name it. And one thing is, I want to bring back production into Germany. The first option is diversifying your risk. The second option is centralization. Again, the first option is a winner, the second option would be making things worse. Thank you, Professor. <coughs> Professor Schneider, anything to accompany that? Again, uh, from the economist perspective, you always have to differentiate between are you talking this on the company level or are you talking this on the macroeconomic level? On a company level, there is nothing against trying to be um, more local. But um, as a word of caution, it, there is always an optimality to it. It's never a maximality. By the way, before the so-called Corona crisis, European companies were backshoring and nearshoring again. Uh, Portugal developed in the mar marvelous IT basis. Georgia, which is, according to me, still on the continent of Europe, was also developing in a, in a very good service sector base. So there were these movements before. On the macroeconomic level, it's always difficult to say we need as a policy thing, we need or a planning thing, we need to renationalize. That doesn't make sense because by renationalizing as a policy measure, 
as a macroeconomic policy measure, we are depriving the poorest of our own society of an integration to the market. They can buy less stuff, they can invest less, less their quality of lives is being wor made worse off because of re-nationalization of, of things. A last comment to the word resilience. Most of you were around in 2007 to 2009. And in 2007 and 2009, everyone was speaking about resilience. Everyone wanted to have more equity to everyone, not only the financial industry, in all sectors of the economy, everyone was claiming for, we need more equity. Today, statistically seen in Europe, in the US, we have a lower equity share than 10 years ago. Um, let, let me let me follow follow up on on not your last point but the point before. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, rebalancing, creating more resilience, um, diversifying, um, not only from an economic point of view, from an economic resilience point of view, but also from a without finding a fi finding an elegant um, a description for this, just basically the ability to to produce specific things that you need, specifically in crisis, that's of course what um, um, COVID-19 has sharpened everybody's mind, on your own, not to be, not to be dependent uh, on, on foreign producers that might not be able or willing uh, to supply you with the goods in terms of crisis. This obviously will have to come from government, and this obviously um, will, will provide a, um, an alien factor, so to say, in the, no in the normal economic uh, uh, um, functioning. Um, how do you see this? Do you see this happening? Number one, how do you see this happening? And how could this be done, for example, on the European level? I, I, I think this is utter nonsense. There is nothing sensical about that statement at all. Uh, that is obviously nonsense because we never know what we will be dependent on. If these state planners were so wonderful, as you seem to imply, why didn't they foresee the need for anything COVID-related? These people couldn't even foresee the need for masks, that was let exactly alone vaccination. The, the argument. And that's what I'm saying. The, the idea might be enticing, not for me, the idea might be enticing, but if you think it through, the first step you will see there is no sense to it whatsoever. The only way we, cannot, we come up with things from which we profit, everyone benefit, is through testing them, trial and error, that's the way, and that cannot be done via central planning. But I completely agree with you, but um, it, um, I, I wish that uh, uh, all, all political decision happened rationally. But what I foresee is there is going to be a public pressure. There already is. So to say, like, look, we need to be prepared. We can't, we can't be dependent on these things. You have this in the US. You have this in Europe. Do you see our politicians being strong enough in the vein that the statement that you just made, this is nonsense. It doesn't make sense. Or um, um, is there a belief in, in, in the backbone of our, our, our politicians to disabuse um, um, the public of these notions? Not only for you, for the general panel. No. <laughs> a simple answer. Do we get some, something more hopeful from your colleagues, Mr. Müller? <laughs> it's, hard, it's, hard, it's hard to argue against that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I may just add one little sentence. Uh, Whenever we have a shock, and this was uh, a major supply shock, the way, best way to bounce back is through entrepreneurial spirits. New companies, new ideas, new entrepreneurs show up. The more we nationalize and the more we allow the government to come into our economy, the more we weaken our entrepreneurial spirits and our entrepreneurial culture. And I've never seen an economy coming back and bouncing back without entrepreneurial skills, culture, hunger, and pride. Regrettably, uh, the coronavirus has enhanced those, let's say, pressures in society that are by and large, against entrepreneurship, uh, against individual responsibility. And I think this is a major challenge we'll be facing during the next three, four years. So 
I'm afraid Enrique Schneider is absolutely right. Uh, this governmental uh, spirit and ghost, which is pervading our economies and Europe in particular, is really most pernicious and it is the major danger, which is far worse than coronavirus. Mm -hmm. I think if, 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 if I may add one one word on the on the on positive note of the governments, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> is is, is in com compared to the financial crisis 2008 2009, the reaction of governments has been much quicker and much more in terms larger in terms of volumes and much more adequate. And I think this this should be acknowledged as well. I think governments have put a lot of money, especially in order to safeguard liquidity and refinancing scheme schemes and this i think this is basically the good news out of this crisis the, sh the sharp and immediate reactions of governments um, i have a um, specific question from the audience um, um, for mr muller um, um, uh, we have we've, we've managed in a, in a british chamber of commerce related um, um, event um, 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 to survive until three quarters, so to say, without the B word, the Brexit. Uh, but of course, it has, it has to come to light. And the question is basically, does your company um, um, see the challenges arising from COVID as more uh, uh, serious uh, than the ones uh, arriving from, from Brexit, specifically, of course, with the specter on the wall that there might still be a no deal Brexit? As, yeah, I guess these are to totally different stories. Uh, the COVID-19 is a major recession and you mentioned this word unprecedented we have some markets where the market where the, where the states collapsed by 80 90 percent and we, and we need something like two or three years to come back to the pre-crisis level and we're losing two or three years of growth i think that that's that's one story which is very important hitting the global automotive industry as such and uh, brexit as, as as brexit itself and and you know you know our position on that we we, we we would love to have UK staying staying in the EU, and our hopes are right now that that COVID nineteen doesn't doesn't foster these protectionist nationalist view that uh, which might then impede a good trade agreement between the UK and the EU. Because otherwise, after COVID nineteen, we will then enter in the beginning of twenty twenty one a new phase where two major trading partners just have to cope with a totally new 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 era, so to speak, which is not good for both sides. So I think we are still concerned about, about Brexit for the long-term perspective and especially for the, for the future of the European Union as such. But uh, right now, in terms of um, the, 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 how the industry is affected, uh, COVID-19 is far more serious. Thank you. Um, I want to go back one more to the, to the, to the systemic level um, challenges, so to say, because I find these very interesting. I think that is, is the, mo the, the most important question that we're going to have to deal with in the, in the medium term um, future, which is the, the imbalance that was already there or the, the trend that was already there of more uh, government, basically government mandated economic area, um, um, activity, if I may put it so, so, so broadly, uh, and that has been strengthened obviously um, through the response in this crisis basically where government take a more and more active um, um, stance in, in, in so to say the running and, and the and the backbone of economic activity um, but how does anybody on the panel see this being 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 um, um, being returned to normal levels given where we are right now and given again the public outcry also for more and more government interact, uh, intervention I mean I'm sitting in Germany where um, that, that vein of thinking has been very strong always in, in different economies um, um, there are different um, um, they're, 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 they're different traditions and different cultures of this. Um, 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 Professor Colombato, actually you, you have argued a fairly tough line here. Um, I think the German um, federal court would, would be very pleased to hear your points, <laughs> if I may say so. But how do you see specifically what we're going through right now and of course, there's almost a, a psychological effect. This is a crisis. People feel threatened. What do they ask for? Government protect us. Uh, while speaking with uh, um, with uh, um, um, President Macron, l'Europe qui protège. Um, um, I very much agree with your with 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 your um, um, 
with, with the idea and with the fundamental approach that that is not the right way. But I don't see us getting out of this trend. I see this trend even strengthening. So what needs to happen and who need to be the actors to make this point? Well, I agree your, with your pessimism. Um, government is here, it is expanding, and it's not going to go back. I mean, I still have to find politicians who are happy to cut their own power and cut their own decision-making power. So, and you said it yourself uh, at the very beginning of this uh, seminar, uh, people, populism is on the rise, right, and populism means basically we want to have more governments. So it's not going to go away. Uh, the only, let's say, hope is that the Italians default. If we go bust, if we go bankruptcy, maybe somebody somewhere else, and maybe even Italy, uh, will wake up and say, hey, look at what happens if you're going, if you keep going that way. Uh, look at where distorted policy making can carry you. So the upshot is that we need a major shock in a major country, a big shake up. And I have another question actually from one of our active participants um, who pointed out, um, um, I will just uh, read what, what, what he wrote. Many people say that Singapore is the example of the future. So will protectionism um, um, potentially not create more cities like Singapore or free private cities in a way Lieberland is already try, try, trying? Well, if you ask me, since I'm, I'm muted, uh, I would be very happy to be run the way Singapore is run. The problem is that we are starting from a notion of the nation state in the West, which is not the same as we have in Singapore. I can't see a large country disintegrate for a variety of reasons. So I'm happy if, look back at Italy, if you went back to Italy with a thousand independent states, I would be happy to see Germany as it was back in the 18th or 19th century. Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's a, exactly the opposite. Uh, by the way, I'm from Turin and we were occupied by the Romans. We were not the conquerors. Um, so I, I would ha be happy to be Singapore that I don't see Western nation governments and nation states disintegrated into millions or thousands or hundreds of Singapore. So wishful thinking. I robustly disagree. Very robustly disagree. I don't oh, think that like Singapore it. is the example for anything at all. If if anything, Singapore is an example of how not to run a place I would like to live. Singapore is a fundamentally totalitarian system ran by state planning. Um, Singapore itself, the ministers himself, they admit that they are a big experiment in social engineering where you have almost no possibility of expressing yourself, where you have to be coerced into a, a way of thinking that changes all 20 years, where you cannot even choose where you live because of some social quota regulating that you have to be in apartment such and such from uh, 200 meters from the nearest park. Um, there are economic problems with Singapore that little people, no people mention. For example, uh, Singapore has some sectors which are extremely productive, but the majority of its labor force, it's not productive at all. Interestingly, the non-productive sectors, which are more or less 70% of its labor force, have been stagnating in income for the last 20 years. This means that there is a disparity between the productive 30% getting richer and richer and the non-productive 70% stagnating and in comparison getting poorer. Also, Singapore, the, 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 the degree, the level of, of state planning in Singapore, from my point of view, ethically problematic, could be seen in this corona crisis. They were very much upset about their population getting infected. But as the 
workers from abroad, the alien workers who are domiciled in Singapore, also got infected. The government just shrugged and said, so what? They're not our people. They're here. They're going to die. We don't, we basically don't care. That was the reaction of Singapore. I think that's very problematic. And let's finish by coming back to Europe. We have a resource that Singapore has not, civil society. We have liberty of thought and we have liberty of making our opinions known. And that is why I would not be as pessimistic as other people and say, oh, the politicians, they want power and people want to give power to the politicians. We have ourselves, we can speak up. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schneider. I think that is actually a good comment um, to, uh, uh, to close. We, we are at, 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 uh, at the top of the hour. Um, we could go on. There are many questions. Um, uh, um, this is more or less an appetizer, I think, um, 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 to, to, to hint at the larger questions. I found it very, very interesting to see uh, the different types of protectionism explained, the trends that are going on, uh, different positions between the US, between China. It would be very interesting to continue the debate, for example, whether there's a way that the US and Europe can combine forces to reign in China, basically on the, on the, on the trade front and on be, being a responsible player in, 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 uh, on, on the um, global, uh, global trade area. Um, uh, but uh, we have run out of time. Let me, let me close by um, thanking again our panel. I thought those were excellent presentations. Um, thanking our organizers, the British Chamber of Commerce in Germany and uh, Geopolitical Intelligence services. Um, I would also say that um, this, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available um, on the website. This is, will it be, Prince Michael, will it be made available on the website of the of, of, of Geopolitical Intelligence Services? Oh, you're muted. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Yep. No, no, I'm not muted. You hear me now? Yeah, yeah no, now you, we hear you. Yeah, it, it, it will be on the website. Of, Very of much. I, I just actually encourage everyone to visit the website because actually you will see, um, um, you will see um, contributions by Professors Colombato and Professor Schneider and everybody should be convinced by the qu intellectual quality of their, co their, 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 their commitment um, on the website. Yeah. Again, thank you very much to both the organizers of the British Chamber of Commerce and uh, Geopolitical uh, Intelligence Service. It was a great pleasure to moderate this. I hope we can do some of these things again. Um, everybody stay healthy and we hope to see you very soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.